This is Caitlin Bailey. I'm the director of communications for a new national organization called Decriminalize Sex Work. We're pursuing a state-by-state -state strategy to end the prohibition of prostitution in the United States. We want to stop the arrests. We have active campaigns in Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Florida, but you can contact your legislator no matter where you live by visiting our website, decriminalizesex.work. You can follow us on Twitter, at decrimsex. So get involved, donate, get on our mailing list, and remember, the best way to end violence and exploitation of vulnerable women in the sex trade is to decriminalize sex work. The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by HotMovies.com. Try out some ethical, paid-for porn for free with none of those hidden fees or secret subscriptions when you sign up at HotMovies.com and use the promo code MANHOR. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. Shout out to all the harlots and whores, strippers and strumpets. This is Billy Presida and you are listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Yeah, you know, strumpets, they, they, does, they don't get enough love these days. Big fan of the word strumpet. I, I don't think it gets used enough. Um, how, what's up, everybody? This week on the show, we've got Alex Andrews from Swap Behind Bars. SWAP, of course, stands for the Sex Worker Outreach Project. We're talking about whores today, everybody. That's that's what's on the agenda this week. And I cannot wait to share some more of her uh, with you in a bit. But first, show Get them hot. Get them dates. Show dates. Yes. Okay. This Sunday, April 14th in Brooklyn, I'm at Gutter Bar at 6 o'clock. I'm doing like a fun game show type thing. It's going to be fun. It's going to be silly. I'm going to be partnered with Tracy Carnazzo who you'll remember from this show. If you want free tickets, just shoot me an email. I can get you free tickets. Just email me. Uh, that's at 6 o'clock. Then next Tuesday, April 16th, anyone anywhere in the world can participate in this. I'm going to be doing a Reddit AMA. Yes, that stands for Ask Me Anything at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, April 16th. As some of you know, April 16th is my five-year podiversary. Oh, wow. Five years of doing this podcast every Wednesday for 260 plus consecutive Wednesdays. I'm super excited. And to help kind of spread the word and to, you know, be able to interact with listeners, I'm going to do a, a Reddit AMA. The way Reddit is set up, though, it really, really helps if I have early engagement. The earliest, the sooner people are asking questions, um, the sooner you, I get upvotes on my post, the more people will see it. So I'd really appreciate if you can come participate. Sign up for my email list at manhorpod.com. I'm going to send an email blast once it goes live, uh, and then you can head on over there and help me out with an early question, a comment, or an upvote, or all three. Again, go to manhorpod.com, sign up for the mailing list, uh, and you will not miss it. But of course, the most important show dates are August 2nd through August 4th, because we're doing ManhorCon again this year. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm so excited. Uh, the, the, the chatter in the peep show, my kick group for my for some of my Patreon people, we've just been chatter, 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 talking about all the excitement around ManhorCon for this year. People are talking travel arrangements. People are starting to flirt a little bit. People are talking about like, oh, my gosh, am I going to get lost in New York City? It's like, don't worry, girl. We're going to put you on a leash so you don't get lost. Uh, super excited for ManhorCon. But what happens at ManhorCon, right? What happens at ManhorCon? You know, because you're spending money. You're ostensibly traveling to New York City. You should know what you're getting for your dollars. Well, let's get a couple of the events out in the open right now. Okay, I don't want to hold on to them for too long. We're going to have a live ManHor podcast show, naturally. We're going to do a live show. I'm probably going to be on stage with some exes. It's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be recorded, and Billy might need a hug afterwards. But, you know, we all know that the, the live Man or Podcast shows are amazing. So we're going to do one of those. And then, and then, we're going to have an exclusive after party after the live show. 
And you know, we all know that's where it goes down. It doesn't just go down in the DMs. It goes down at the Manhorcon after party as well. You're not going to want to miss it. It's also just a great way, not just like, like meeting Billy is pff, whatever. It's a great way to like connect and hang out with fellow fan whores for a really fun weekend in New York City. So, so you, what you're going to want to do is right now you're going to want to go to manwhorepod.com slash weekend. You're going to want to get your early bird discounted weekend pass while you still can. Okay. And then you're going to get, you know, start focusing on getting that paid time off of work. Start looking at flights. Start looking at accommodations. So one more time, go to manwhorepod.com slash weekend, and I'll see you in August. I want to give a little shout out to, uh, you know, it's been a while. Since Dylan Birdsall, my buddy Dylan Birdsall was on the podcast. That was episode 128. I know that feels so long ago. But his documentary, V Card the Film, is finally available. Yes, you can get it on iTunes and Amazon and all those digital marketplaces. And if you don't remember, V Card is a documentary he made about virginity in America because he was a 25 year old virgin. Yeah. So uh, I'm really happy that documentary is finally out. I'm in it for like a moment. Go show him some love. And uh, Dylan, congrats, buddy, on that. Uh, I've got I've got some listener feedback I want to get to. But first, I want to talk a little bit about HotMovies.com. All right. You know, hey, last week we talked about porn star Jay Taylor and uh, the role she inadvertently played in uh, maybe or maybe not my breakup with Shay, right? Well, why don't you go see what all the fuss is about? You can go uh, look at her movies at hotmovies.com. You know, some of the titles she's in uh, are like Orgy Marathon, Nerd Girls, Lesbians in Charge 2. Um, There's one called Three-Way Trouble, which honestly, I don't know what all the trouble's about. You're in a three-way. Like, just enjoy it. There shouldn't be any trouble. Um, But Jay Taylor's in that with like a lot of really hot people. And you can get access to all those movies and hundreds of thousands of other films when you go to hotmovies.com and use promo code MANHOR. It is a pay-per-minute porn site, so it's just an ethical and affordable way to hashtag pay for your porn. Not only do you want to pay for your porn, but you also want to support the companies that support me. All right. I got an email I want to read. All right. Um, So last week I read a, a, a fairly stern dare I say, angry email from Hunter. Well, you know, I got an email back from him. It reads, hey, darling. Wow. What an emotional episode yesterday. I send you so much care and affection for going through that. It sounded exactly as tough as you described. I think you're right. I took that a little too far. And I'm sorry for any undue stress I caused you. I feel like you handled the situation beautifully. And I was so impressed by your thoughts on it yesterday. Thank you so much for taking the time and effort to listen to some random asshole who just wrote you out of the blue. I was thinking yesterday that if one lives with their life bared on a podcast, you're going to get the bad with the good, and not one of us is perfect. So thanks for being comfortable enough to share your not-so-shiny sides and be open to criticism about them. Also, very, very good point about being enraged for other people's sake. Sometimes I should be reminded that it's not my place to be upset for others especially if I don't know how they feel. Anyway, keep up the good work, and if you ever want to come visit Berlin to see the amazing sex poly queer scene we've got here, you've got a happy and willing guide, I'd love to take you to Kit Kat Club and see what you think. Oh, also, Hunter re-upped his pledge. He not only um, put his pledge back on Patreon, he raised his pledge as a way of saying, uh, my bad. But, you know, at one point he makes, I do want to just shine a light on for a moment is that yes like when you live your life online that and and you digest my life online you are going to get bad parts of me but that's the thing a lot of other people and personalities or whoever you know won't do so they're going to always seem shiny and awesome um but that's because they kind of hide and they pick and choose which are the good things they're going to share with the world and i'm just like i don't really know how to filter i'm just going to give you all of it and you're going to have to figure out what kind of messy human being i am Because, like, hey, look at it. Pick any sex educator that you love. Um, They've done and said shitty things. Facts. Okay? We're seeing that right now, like, with all, you know, the quote-unquote popular guys getting called out right now. Like, you know, like, Reed and Charlie Glickman and, I guess, Franklin Vo. 
Whatever somebody wants to say about me, that critic will never give me their cell phone unlocked and the names of their exes. So I can go, you know, see what they've said when they've been upset. Because anyone can get screenshotted. I just choose to put it all out there. And uh, and I hope sometimes putting it all out there means sometimes it's funny, too. There are no heroes. You know, I'm certainly not one. But uh, thank you for, for writing back in, Hunter. Uh, and as he, you know, he alludes to the Shea episode last week, that was a very, you know, difficult episode for me to put out. I think it's the most difficult episode I've ever produced, emotionally. And, and I've also... Never gotten so much feedback as I did on this, especially in my super secret Facebook group, The Champagne Room, which is for my uh, Patreon members. I mean, that was an active. It's still active. There's still comments getting put on it as I record this on Tuesday. I think there's like over 50 comments just about this one episode. And I want to read a few of them uh, for you right now. I promise they're not all like, you go girl, Billy. You know, some of them are like this first one, but. You'll see what I mean. Uh, Madeline commented, I thought this was a really beautiful episode, a great example of the power of the concept of your show. This was the kind of conversation that most people never get to have. Reiterating what other people said, I was similarly put off by the guest, and you definitely didn't come across badly. In fact, after your intro and Patreon posts about this, I was bracing myself for a very uncomfortable, tense convo. So I put off listening for a bit. I ended up pleasantly surprised. You painted a picture of a very tumultuous relationship that was intense in both good and bad ways. I thought you did a good job of approaching the whole convo with kindness, professionalism, and honesty. The episode really demonstrated that some people just have irreconcilable differences, no matter how carefully they try to find middle ground and negotiate. And that is okay. And it doesn't mean there can't be peace. Due to some events in my life right now, I needed to hear that anecdote you shared from therapy about why we all try to decide who is right or wrong in situations. We've got to be comfortable being sometimes bad, in the gray area, and confident when we know we're right. Sarah writes, uh, I finally finished this episode. I definitely don't think you're a monster, and I fully agree with others that their personality rubbed me the wrong way. There were a couple of times when I could definitely tell that you were pissed off, but you were holding back. I remember on one episode a long time ago when you mentioned that the feedback you've gotten from your exes is basically to just feel less, which I think is something, uh, I think that was from the Man Con live show. I think that's something Emily said. You know, in listening to this episode, I can't help but wonder if you've taken that to heart The whole time I was listening, I feel like you gave them every opportunity to be emotionally honest. Well, it seemed like you were holding back so much. I can't help but wonder if that was because you're worried about what people would think if you didn't hold back, or if you always give their feelings higher priority than yours, or if you were just being a good interviewer. Either way, I applaud you for doing this. It takes a big person to open up something so deeply personal to the whole world. Dervla. She chimes in, uh, I thought the fingering thing was clearly an example of different interpretations of boundaries. Not cheating, because you weren't cognizant of crossing a boundary at the time. Also, the example of a burlesque show being a venue where something might happen, but not a porn convention, is seriously reaching. Ultimately, feelings aren't always logical, but this should have been an iterative experience in which the worst motives weren't automatically assumed just going to expose my ignorance for a moment, everyone. I don't know what the word iterative means. Um, oops. The idea that more relationship experience would have turned you into a mind reader is complete nonsense. No two people have exactly the same boundaries and interpretations of everything. I can see how Ross and Rachel type drama like this must have been hurtful and infuriating. I think a more charitable interpretation of your actions and motives would have gone a long way. I don't think you are right to deny they're referring to that text exchange as they're coming out to you. But I don't think that was necessarily the kindest medium to use to come out to your partner. I think you both came across very well during the podcast, but it sounds like the relationship was probably very high conflict and painful. Uh, The last one I want to read comes from Wilhelm. Get Get a fella's perspective in here. In regards to the AVN debacle, I think you were both in the wrong on some level. The situation could clearly be seen as clinical, 
and maybe you should have been more considerate. That's valid. I think the ultimate importance that they attributed to that also speaks to not giving you the same luxuries you afforded them. This was a gray area in the parameters y'all set on your relationship. For them to see it in black and white was downright unforgiving. I believe a lot of love is about forgiveness. I don't think they afforded you that, and I got the feeling that your fights were more about you being right. So, you know, and th- that was just some of the comments, and there was a lot of, like, sub-comments under a lot of those. Was, last week's episode really sparked a lot of conversation uh, in the Champagne Room, and I thought that was really awesome to see amongst my patrons. So, just to give everyone an idea what that entire Jay Taylor thing was about, because, again, the incident, you know, it's behind a paywall. It's uh, It's on Patreon, so most of you can't hear that. So I'm going to play a couple clips from the Jay Taylor bonus episode, you know, where my hand is on her vulva or in her vagina. And I use such clinical terms because that's honestly how it felt. Yes, there's going to be a cut, but that's just to cut out when my fingers are like not there. Um, I promise I'm not cutting out the really spicy part where we got pornographic. Um, And I guess you can make your own determinations, but, you know, my estimation was like, this is not a hookup. And that's why I didn't contact them. I like to think I understand a lot of the, the, the girl body stuff at this point. Uh, and, and then every once in a while, someone throws a new thing at me. I'm like, what? Now I got to learn. Like the A spot. What the fuck? There's a new letter spot thing. Okay. If we're talking about this. Okay. Yeah. I have found in s- sexual experiences that a lot of men, since I have my pussy out, a lot of yes, men please. don't know that there's different freaking parts. Oh, yeah. It's like a Nina Hartley show. I did. Like, a-, there, a lot of men will be like, oh, my God. So you know that there's the head under the clit. Mm-hmm. And there's all the nerve ending right there. Yeah. Don't just stay on that. Mm-hmm. That shit is too much. Like, okay. Okay. Like, I'll show you I'm getting a full on demonstration. Tri- right now. I don't, some- I mean, like, <laughs> I like to think I already know this, but I am loving that I'm getting the demonstration anyway. <laughs> Billy's running over. Okay. So, okay. So, there- <laughs> all the men are slowly, all the men in the room are slowly walking over so we can all uh, partake in such a demonstration. <laughs> Will you touch me? Uh, sure. Okay. I, I, okay. So I'm going to show you some shit. I'm going to show you is, some cool is, stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to teach you some stuff right now. All right. This is amazing. So, okay. Are you cut or uncut? Uh, I'm cut. Okay, cool. But you know how foreskins work Correct. and they protect the penis. Okay. So I have my shaft of my clitoris okay. is under the hood. So if you pinch the sides of my clitoris mm-hmm. and you can jerk off my clit slow. Now, kind of roll your fingers. So, what you're doing right now is you're jerking off my clit that I am, over I am the hood of um, my, my, my clitoris. And uh, that's sorry, really, really, having... really good. And you're not hurting me, and you don't need any lubrication because you're not inside me or under the hood. Okay. So, this is really, really pleasurable for me. And you can do it for a really long time, and it's not going to hurt your fingers or make your Because it's also not making your clit like. It's not too much. Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's not direct. Okay. So now yeah, I taught you a cool trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> for Patreon, we do all the things. Yes, yes, we do, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so men think that there's just the G spot and they like, and I'm going to do this thing. And she'll like, like if you, I'm gonna, you're, you're fingering me. Okay. 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 So put give me your finger. Okay. She's, 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 um, she's, okay. put your middle finger okay. into my vagina. Now rotate down. Okay. Rotate down. Rotate down. Rotate. Wait, down, whole, down towards the couch. Your whole hand. Oh, yeah, this. Oh, okay. Go. Okay. There you go. Okay. So now push down. Okay. And see what you're so, you're so cute. <laughs> you're trying to fuck me. So like, you're not fucking me. <sighs> see what you're doing now is you're pushing down on where my muscles are. Okay. And so it feels like there's a big dick in me. See, I feel like we're all taught to do the rotate up. That's where my G-spot is, which you can do. But this is like a fucking, this is a much deeper, slower sensual fingering thing. 
you just finger my pussy. Hi, Billy. I mean, I can keep going. I was just trying to be, I was like, it's like, you, you, you know, it's like fair use. You're like, you have to, in fair use, you have to use the amount that exactly the amount you need before it's like, too much. So I'm just like, okay. I'm trying to do as much, as much fingering as like I'm allowed to do without going like one thrust too much. Yeah. Just be, just, there's, there's so much to do here. And like mm-hmm. Nina, she'll like, you rub all. Again, if you want to hear me cheat on Shay in full, uh, or, you know, just learn something about the vagina. That bonus episode is available to all $5 and up members on Patreon. Uh, speaking of Patreon, it's time for the fan whore appreciation moment. Okay. This is the part of the podcast where I like to give a little shout out to some of the members of my fan whore community on Patreon. And what is Patreon? Well, it's a great way to support the podcast and become a member of an awesome sex positive community of like minded listeners. Just, I've only been doing this for five years. You know, I, I feel like I deserve a couple dollars out of you. So right now, I want to give a shout out to the people who put the dollars where the downloads are. Luke Adams. Thank you, buddy. Uh, I see you're an MFT. That's pretty cool. Keeping the families together or separating them when they should be. Uh, Way to do like actual good things in the world, man. Michael Bishop. I want to say thank you, buddy. You you seem cool based on my little bit of research, but I got to say, your dad looks like a badass. Let's get him in the peep show too, <laughs> you know, or, you know, but we're happy to have you as well, sir. And uh, thank you to Amber Lynn Kaler. She's uh she's one of our new super active peep show members. And uh, I am so excited to finally meet you in August at man Con. And you too can become a part of this awesome sex positive community and support the show that you listen to probably every week. When you sign up at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash podcast. And now for this week's guest, Alex Andrews. So, you know, April 16th is not the only anniversary coming up. Um, April 11th, which is tomorrow, if you're listening to this on the day it comes out. Uh, t- tomorrow, April 11th, is the anniversary of SESTA and FOSTA being signed into law. You've heard me and many of my guests rail against SESTA and FOSTA uh, for like the last year. That's It's the reason why I don't have an Instagram, right? Okay, you know, um, we all know that's the true tragedy here. But don't worry, I'm going to make a new Instagram soon, I promise. We've already seen a lot of effects, a lot of trickle down effects. A lot of the effects of SESTA Foster are kind of trickle down. They're almost in, they're almost inadvertent effects, and that's kind of that was the whole idea. So you wouldn't be mad at the actual government; you'd be mad at these platforms. But the platforms are only doing it because of the government's new law. That's why we saw Patreon make the announcement they did last year about adult content, even though they're working hard to keep us on the platform. Um, that's why you, part of the reason why you saw Tumblr get rid of porn. That's why you saw Facebook and Instagram tighten up their guidelines, okay? It's all it's all part of this this plan to censor the internet. And I recorded with Alex Andrews from Swap Behind Bars uh, while I was at AVN in Las Vegas back in January. Um oh my gosh, she is such a fucking delight. I emailed her, found out we were both going to be in Vegas and said we should record and she like instantly offered me a place to sleep. So like you can sleep on our on our hotel couch for free. She doesn't know me. She had no reason to do that. She doesn't know how problematic or scary or dangerous I could potentially be. And she was like, no, please take my couch. So that was pretty fucking great. Um, I think she's great. I think she's the shit. Uh, my voice is shot because I'm a fucking idiot. I forget if I shared this with y'all, but basically two nights before leaving for Vegas, I went out to a bar with a guy from one of the gangbangs. Like we were, we had the gangbang. And then after the gangbang, we met up at a bar and we just like stayed out until 4 a.m. And because it got to be a little bit shouty in a loud bar, oops, I lost my voice two days before leaving for a business trip where all I was supposed to be doing was talking. Oops. So that's why Billy's voice sounds really shitty uh, in this week's episode. My apologies. Uh, another thing that's a little embarrassing is, oh my gosh, I think I was, just, I don't know why, but I guess I was trying to throw out every pro sex worker, sex positive buzzword my brain could think of. 
I think in part because I wanted to make Alex and um, the other woman who was staying in the hotel room from the Woodhull uh, Foundation, I, I guess I wanted them to, to really be certain that this face is like on the same team. So like I did some heavy code switching and I didn't even realize it until I was re-listening to this episode months later. I was like, oh, Jesus, who am I trying to impress? Um, but, you know, it was a fun conversation. Uh, Swap Behind Bars, by the way, I'll just I'll, I'll explain very briefly. It's an organization that helps pair you up with incarcerated sex workers. They may or may not be in prison for sex work, but they are people who identify as sex workers who are in um, prison. And I've done it before. I'm currently pen palling with two inmates right now that I just started. Uh, I think it's really, really great to do. Even if you want to do a one-off where you're saying like, hey, I can't you know, do a back and forth, but I just want to let you know there's people out on the outside who give a shit and are fighting hard to you know, make the country a more welcoming place for sex workers and for women to do with their bodies whatever the fuck they want to do with their bodies. It's a great organization. I highly recommend um, checking out Swap Behind Bars. But for now, let's get to my conversation with Alex Andrews. I just meant a really more editing out um uh or if it's like really boring <laughs> I, I don't i don't think it's gonna be boring from what i mean well you used to be a sex worker right yeah um i still consider or, myself a sex worker okay um i mean it you can always be a sex worker i mean that's the one thing that's the one thing that's my identity mm-hmm. is is i am a sex worker i'm a sex worker activist i'm an advocate um yes a former sex worker yes you know Current or former? Like you don't currently practice. A non-practicing not, sex worker. Um, Ooh. Not officially. Officially. Not officially. Unofficially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I mean. There's no When ads you've done up. it for a long time, you, and there's no ads up. Yeah. But when you've done it for a long time, you place a monetary value on the activity or the whatever. So um, I'm married. I've been married for going on 20 years. So, um, so I, I do identify, I mean, yes, I identify as a sex worker, but I think that when you have done sex work, you place monetary values on things. And so sex is worth something. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, yeah, it's a, um, I mean, there's not like a set price for sex with my husband, but you know, I mean, it costs him money. <laughs> yeah. It's like those yeah. dishes. After... <laughs> those dishes ain't going to do themselves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, no, and I want to live in a nice house. <laughs> so <laughs> do you see marriage as like some kind of like almost like a very nuanced form of sex work at to- in ways? Um... You know, it's really funny. I, I think in relationships in general are kind of a nuanced form of exchange of something, you know, but um, intimate relationships, yeah, they, they they are a little bit. They are a little bit of an exchange of, um, of money for sex. Mm-hmm. And I don't really think that there's anything wrong with that. And I don't think that anybody has any problems with that. And, and my husband doesn't have a problem with it, mm-hmm. you know. But would you have sex with him if he wasn't giving you like the nice big house or something? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would because I do love him. You know, I mean, and and that's the difference between him and any of the other. He's the longest relationship I ever had. Which is the long, how long? the longest relationship that I ever had before him was I call it six weeks. My I used to call it the, I'm the six week wonder because it would be two weeks of oh my god this is the one. Then there would be two weeks of eh. And then there would be two weeks of how the fuck am I going to get out of here? Because, you know, I mean, I'm all in sure. or I'm all out. <laughs> Ooh. Well, how long have you been with your husband? Um, since 1998. All right. And we've been separated a couple of times in between then. Um, he oh, went so to like- prison for a while. Oh. Um, I was in, um, I got caught from my probation violation while we were together. And so I spent some time away. Mm. Um, and then we kind of came together and we both brought all of our personality disorders and all of our addictions and all of our s- complicated backstories in together. And then we helped each other grow out, grow through them. Oh, wow. And become grown ups. Oh, so you're a grown up now. No, I'm not. Well, yeah. <laughs> Working sort on of, it? I, I sort of am. I, <laughs> I, I sort of am. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very mommy ish. Kind of, which is bizarre because I don't have kids. I never wanted to have kids. Never had any desire to have children. But um, I, I very much like taking care of people. Mm. 
Oh, well, I do. I really like taking care of people, and I really like being a, a good hostess, and you know, and making sure that people think that. You've been a fantastic hostess. <laughs> you've been more no, than generous. You know, it's a it's a it's a sofa, but you know, it's a great sofa. Uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't suck. <laughs> well, this is a good time to say, like, I'm sitting down right now with Alex Andrews from Swap, a sex worker outreach project. Hey. Hello, hello. Um, should I be saying sex worker outreach project behind bars, or should I be saying Swap? Uh, USA or what, what's well I sit on the board of directors for Swap USA okay um, uh, Swap Behind Bars is the sex worker outreach behind bars and we originally started out as a chapter of Swap USA mm. um, in May of 2016 uh, a little bit into it we realized it was going to be just huge and um, Swap USA didn't really have the capacity to support us in the way that we needed to be supported in, in order to do that. Okay. And so we had a 501c3 from previous work because I've kind of been doing advocacy for a while now. And I know a lot of people who have been doing advocacy. So we put the Sex Worker Outreach Project behind bars under another 501c3 in order so that we could be a little bit more... Um, we could do a little bit more of what we needed to do and, and operate in a little bit, a little bit quicker. Mm. And, um, and that's worked out really well. All right. And I've, I've talked about swap, uh, several times on the podcast mm -hmm. over the, like over the years. Um, I, I was, I had a pen pal through it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a fan of that. That was a fun interaction to do. I'm looking forward to, uh, getting back into it. Uh, the woman I was writing is now out <laughs> much better than the other one. Cause the other woman I was paired up with was like, <laughs> that one did <laughs> That like it was it was it was harmless. It was like uncomfortable but harmless. It was uh -huh. so I got matched up with someone, um, and I sent like my initial letter and in it like I explained, Oh, I do this like podcast and uh <laughs> I guess she thought I would be a better fit for like her her friend. So she passed my letter to her without and then, consent. Yeah. And then I just got a letter back from a different inmate who's like, Yeah, like my friend passed this along, thought we'd be good together. There were like some to get some together language that should have been a red flag, mm -hmm. but then starts being like, I'm really into this and that. She's like telling me all of her kinks and her fetishes. And it's like, like as if I'm going to be her dirty pen pal. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> what do I do with this? Yeah. It's like, do I jerk off to it? Do I throw it away? I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, uh, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really cool thing that y'all do. Uh, and, and it's not just the pen pal matching. I think you also try to help get books in there. And like you do, I was listening to you talk all day. Like you do a lot of work to help these women who are incarcerated or, and men uh, who help are incarcerated. Them help themselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, we want to provide resources for people so that um, we feel like community is so incredibly important. Um, it's so important to have um, people that you can talk to and people who are in prison, like sex workers in a lot of ways, are so isolated. Um, a lot of times they've been just completely abandoned by their family. Their friends may be living lives that they can't obviously participate with mm -hmm. at the time. Um, they've been involved in things that they don't want to be involved in. So it's incredibly isolating. Um, they don't know, they, they're not caught up on the news. They don't know about boundaries. Um, they don't know that we're having conversations about consent. The Me Too movement doesn't mean anything to them because they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, And they, we, might even, they might even be locked up wrongfully from someone who like uh, you, you know, know that's, the, that's an interesting thing to bring up um there's never been any research to determine how many people are locked up for assaulting or killing their abuser which just was in the news vastly i don't know when this episode comes out but like we in this real time yes. as, as we're at avn it's like uh what is it Sint Sintoya brown yeah mm -hmm. um got released yep. got part well, was pardoned or she what was actually granted clemency what is clemency um clemency is where the governor says that you can get out of jail um but Why it is doesn't that different from pardon a you but it doesn't pardon you from the crime which means that she could still be on parole or um you not know, be allowed to vote to, stuff like that not be allowed to vote she still won't have her civil rights um you know that kind of thing but you know there's a possibility that because it's a state crime i don't believe that she's in a federal 
prison. I don't think she was in a prison. No, it, it, it was a state thing. So it everyone was a state was, thing. Yeah. So she could be have her sentence vacated at some point in time. You know, since she's been in there, she's gotten her bachelor's degree. Um, she's really made some serious accomplishments. And um, a lot of people worked really hard, um, you know, including us, to support her getting cle- clemency from the governor. Um, you know, we also worked with another person in um, California um, that was in prison for trafficking when she had actually been a trafficking victim herself. And, you know, she turned 18 and then two weeks later they had this bust and um, she went to prison for trafficking. Why? Because like she was like a, the uh, because an adult she was or something, she or? was now she was eighteen and they had a sixteen or seventeen year old. Um, and they're you like, know, well, you were working trafficking, together yeah. because working together helps keep sex workers safe. Right. You know, so that's uh, in in the street economies. We we always encourage people to work together, do drugs together, because that way someone knows where you're at or if you're in harm's way. But don't you also uh, would you also say you advocate to like not be doing sex work when you're underage? Well. That's I mean, if, not, if you have the control over to do it, I mean, obviously, well, you know, the age of consent is 18. So, of course, it would be ideal if we lived in a world where children or people who are under the age of consent, or let's just say the age of 21, when maybe you might be making better decisions, was in a position to where they didn't have to run away from home because Mm. they didn't have a good family environment or they were experiencing abuse or sexual violence or, um, you know, or, or, or their family didn't accept them because they were, they identified as LGBT or whatever. I mean, it would be wonderful if we lived in that world and, um, and, and they could make a decision to not do that, but we don't, live in that world but i mean and i understand why people in these like marginalized communities sometimes turn to sex work Mm -hmm. underage but i still wouldn't be chill with someone who is an adult enabling a minor to do sex work right like i would and and it's not and it's not legal or it's not right and Mm. but at the same time you still have to have the conversation about resources you know um 16 and 17 year olds work together all the time on Mm. the street because they know that they can help each other stay safer um 51 percent of young people people under the age of 18 state that their biggest fear um from working isn't from clients it's not from pimps um it's from uh it's from cops Mm. You know, uh, the the fear of being arrested because for a juvenile, if they get caught doing sex work, it's not just going to jail, bonding out and, and, and getting back to work. They could be sent back to an abusive home. They could be Mm -hmm. sent to juvenile detention. They could, um, you know, they could be be put in a foster home where they're going to be further abused. I mean, the, the repercussions are so much worse. Um, so it, and, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why we say if you really care about sex trafficking victims and, and children who are out there trading sex, you need to really examine what you're offering them as resources, you know, because it what's kid, driving them to go wh- out. Why are they doing that? Yeah. Why are they, why are they ending up out there? And it's because our community, uh, our communities, our society, our families are broken. Um, w- there's a lot of, um, things in our society that people don't understand or they're not, they're not paying attention to. And so a lot of times it, 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 we, we've bred this situation for this stuff to happen. You know, our, our, our society has, has created this environment for kids who aren't accepted where they're at to make decisions that, you know, uh, as adults, we don't, think are the right decisions and and so when um you know when were you practicing sex work like uh, not the um, marriage version yeah. uh, you know, like, what? um i was working i i graduated early from high school um smarty i had pants. gone to huh so yeah pants. sort of um i i i went to beauty school and i got um my license and i was working in a salon um i was living away from my parents i was 17 mm. and um I found out that there was a strip club. I needed money to pay rent because sure. this, you know, the even though I was earning decent money at the salon, I needed money to pay rent. You know, it was apartment. I wanted a car. You know, all that kind of thing. So I looked up in the Penny Saver, and there there was an ad for um, semi. Uh, they called it semi topless cocktail waitresses. Yeah. 
Okay, so my top top of this cocktail waitresses. So I called the strip club and I said, um, uh, "What is semi topless?" And they said, "Well, you have to wear pasties." And so I said, "Okay, thanks." And I hung up and I, thought, like I called them back. I said, "What are pasties?" <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, honey, um, if you need to ask, right? You know, no. and it was basically the penny saver was saying um, you could earn a thousand dollars a week, and I was like, "Cool, I could use a thousand dollars a week." Um, so, um, I went down, I applied, I started working as a cocktail waitress. Um, eventually I started, um, stripping. Um, I went to, I worked in several clubs in the Houston, um, Dallas area Mm -hmm. and, um, I moved to San Antonio to, um, be with a girl that I thought that I was madly in love with during one of these six week things. Mm -hmm. And, um, I thought that this was the one I was going to be with her forever. And, um, I moved to San Antonio and I delivered a drink up to the second floor of the strip club DJ, which is where the DJ was. And on my way back down, I slid down the stairs and broke my kneecap. And I ended up, <laughs> obviously, stripping was no longer that, that's, <laughs> on the table. <laughs> that's the stripping version of just like, you know, day one of his rookie career blows out his knee. Exactly. And it feels exactly. done. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's all over. So you sound I like know, my uncle's like, I would have gone pro do? if I had blown out my knee in college. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where I'd be? Sure. Um, so um, I called some Probably yellow pages. <laughs> I called some places in the yellow pages and, um, and said, so what's an escort <laughs> you know you, you don't know unless you ask right but also that's like that's a <laughs> yeah <trap>. uh, <laughs> yeah exactly and a friend of mine had they were like uh, no way cop click. and they, <laughs> this, yeah they came and met me in the parking lot of uh, denny's and um the Very guy was driving this old beat up truck and i got in the front seat and he said okay we're only gonna see it send you to regulars this is like really creepy long-haired hippie looking guy okay and he said we're you know we'll send you to regulars it's um 200 bucks for an hour it's 150 bucks for a half hour um you get i don't remember what the split was i don't remember what it was I don't remember at all. Sure. But anyway, I said, we'll call you. And so I said, okay. So I got out of the car. You didn't have um, to blow him in the car? That's usually no, how uh-uh, the story no, 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 goes. No, uh-uh, no, the, you, yeah. there was no, there was no audition. Sure. He just, he just met me in the parking lot, told me what the deal was, um, you know, what the split was, didn't say what I had to do, didn't say any of, any of that sort of thing, sure. but just that they would have a regular that would call me and, or that they would call me for a regular client to start with. Yeah. And um, about, Maybe two hours later, they called me. They said they had a regular client that wanted to see me for a half an hour, which was 150 bucks. It meant I think I was going to make 90. So um, I went to the little motel, no-tell motel. I went in there, and in seven minutes, I blew him. He was done. And I walked out of there with this incredible feeling of power. Yeah. I was like, fuck yes. <laughs> a different power than the power. Do you feel power when you give blowjobs? Not for pay? Or did you back then? Yeah, so sure. Was, you have like total control. Was it a different type of power feeling when you were getting paid? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a it was a exhilarating feeling. Mm. It was an exhilarating feeling. Yeah. It was like, yeah, this is this is it. This is what I'm gonna do. And so um And yeah, and you're like how old for this? Oh, 21. Cool. Okay. You know, 21, 22. Um I worked for them for about a year and a half. We're good. Okay. I'm just keeping my eye. So if the battery runs out, it doesn't make like a sound, just the lights will go off. So I'm just like, every once in a while I'm checking in. So okay. Don't, All don't, right. <laughs> don't, mind, don't mind me when I'm writing stuff for checking this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I here. just didn't, I thought if you need to change the batteries, we can. <laughs> no, no, I'm just going to keep I'll remember this. <laughs> it'll, like, it'll likely last. I just, I keep an eye on it just in case. Okay. It, otherwise sometimes like it's happened where like I'm not looking and I never check. And then we end up uh. like doing like 10, 20 minutes and it was off the whole time. Oh, know? okay. So, All right. You're good. You're All good. Good. Right. Um, good. Yeah. So you're powerful. So, so I, I, I walked out of there and I, I was money. like, I was like, yeah, this is, this is the bomb. And so they called, they called me afterwards and, and they were shocked that I was out in seven minutes <laughs> and they said, um, and they said, everything go okay. And I said, yeah. And I it never was fine. did like that. Call about, me again. I never did like that about sex work that it was billed as time when really they mean like a cup. Uh huh. Yeah. And I'm just like, then just say that. Like, just say like this, put cap at that time. Because then I think, like, if I get like, I'm a happy ending massage patron. Like, big fan of that. Uh-huh. Uh But but not like the like, give me a hot 22 year old who like rubs your back for 10 minutes to like, okay, turn over. I'm like, no 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 no. I need like a real massage. <laughs> 
Like when I call up, like I'm usually asking questions like, what are your actual massage skills like? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Cause that's like where my interest lies. I never liked it when like, okay, we're like 40 minutes in. I think, cause when I was in college and first started again, I'm like, they would like be like, okay, cool. We're done. I'm like, there's like another 20 minutes. Like I so, you still give me the rest of my massage. Like, <laughs> you know, th- it was a different time. <laughs> sure. um, and obviously then we were working off of yellow pages yeah. um, ads. So there wasn't, you know, when somebody called in and said that they wanted to see yeah. someone, they were basically taking the person's word on the phone, what you look like, you sure. know, that kind of thing. So uh, there was always the question, um, you know, they have pictures. Yeah, it, there was no pictures. Wow. You didn't have. I mean, there was no way to communicate pictures. We didn't have cell phones in that. <laughs> yeah, there was a time before. <laughs> there was a time before podcast. Wait, what yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> yes, there was. Yes, I don't was. recognize any time before uh-huh. podcasting. <laughs> yeah. So it was yellow pages. It was all about the yellow pages, and you know, we stood around. We waited for someone to call, and then when they called, you described the girl, and um, you know, he'd see, say he wanted to see a blonde with big boobs or whatever. And were and, you the blonde with big boobs? Yeah, I okay. mean, I was uh. several blondes with big boobs. Sure. You know, I mean, if they didn't want the green eyed one, then I would put in my blue contacts. You know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I've been a redhead. Because I had a red fuck them wig, for being you know, that yeah. picky. Yeah. I mean, that's really, that's color. what you're going to do for it, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was really it. And I mean, there were, there were days when I went to see regular clients and just changed the name and um, put in different contacts and... And, Shut you know, up. I mean, yeah, I they mean, thought it was a totally I different wore person. a wig or, you know, something. Like, yeah. I mean, and you that's... fucked the same people and they thought you were different people. Well, or times. they or they went along with it. Sure. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I didn't even know that was like a thing. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, the at the time, I think that I, I don't think that they would recognize people that came to their hotel rooms anyway. I yeah. mean, you know, uh, so it's it, we all knew what we were there for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was kind of the beauty of the time is everybody knew what we were all there for. Nobody had to ask any questions. We knew what an escort service was. You knew what you were going to get. Well, except for you, you, know. you had to call me like, what's yeah, an well, escort? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be real. In college, like, I actually also had to look it up to be like, is that the same as a prostitute or no? I don't, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Well, I'm, you know, and there were a lot of girls who said that they didn't. And I was like, bullshit. You know, you do. Yeah, you it's know? like, are you actually just going out yeah. to the movies? Like, no, shut and up. why yeah. would I want to go to a movie with this guy? You know, <laughs> that was really kind of my attitude. Hi. <laughs> yeah, um, I had no desire to go to dinner with someone. It was, you know, I wanted to to go in, do the deed, and move on. Yeah. You were talking about how you, uh, you've you been locked up several times, right? Yeah. Um, it sounded like the first uh, was the first one that time you talked about from when you were 25 or had, did it was um, even earlier? It was, yeah, that was, that was the first time I had been, um, I had been working for this particular service for a while. Um, then all of a sudden they disappeared and, um, I didn't know what I was going to do because I was, uh, obviously I was out of work and, um, I said, well, I don't want this to happen again. So I opened my own escort service and I had, um, my own ads in the yellow pages and, um, I had friends that I had met while I was working for them and we built up really quickly and it became a very social kind of enterprise and the cops came after us, the vice units came after us. And so I was arrested for aggravated promotion of prostitution. Um, they arrested a bunch of my girls for What's it. What's unaggravated that, promotion well, of prostitution? <laughs> like, is that what said, I do when I'm just I've like very... i said <laughs> it was aggravating. I don't know that it's aggravated. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I was really chill about it. I was like, hey yeah. guys, like you should do some stuff. Aggravated is when it's three or more people who are involved in a crime. Gotcha. And when you are charged with something um, that includes the word aggravated, that means that if you go do prison time you're not eligible for gain time and you're not i mean it's kind of a scar Mm. you know um they tried to get me with rico they tried to get me with the irs they tried to get me with a lot of different things but back then the fbi and the irs just weren't interested in hookers Mm. you know they just weren't interested at all so um i i hired a lawyer um i moved to florida and um I never, you know, about three years later, I went, pled guilty. They sentenced me to 10 years of sex offender probation. What does that mean? It means that um, they wanted me to register as a sex offender. But only for 10 years. Huh? But only for 10 years. No, 10 years. They wanted... I would as have, in like you would be on a list for I would for have been on years. a sex offender registry for the rest of my life. Oh. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. And this is in, you know, 93. So um, the oh, sex offender re- registry was, re- regu- was, was relatively new. Wow. You know, so, um, or 91. This was in 91. Okay. And so um, this was this was something that was scary. Well, I had already moved to Florida and it was Texas that I committed my crime in and um, Florida did not have the same statutes. And since I had moved to Florida, they said that they were going to transfer my probation to Florida. Mm -hmm. So I transferred, they transferred my probation to Florida and I got this awesome probation officer who refused to accept the terms of their probation. And they said, no, she doesn't have to register as a sex offender. So I never had to register as a sex offender. Thank whoever you choose to Woo! thank. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, cause exactly. how different life would be. Yeah. Uh, life would be a whole you wouldn't different. like back then you wouldn't realize how much it would fuck you that you Didn't couldn't like have, any have a smartphone because like if you're on the sex funder registry like aren't you like not allowed to have like you can't go on of, the internet yeah. you can't and you know they they back then especially i think they're doing more so now i mean you're not allowed to be on the internet you're not allowed to have a smartphone you're not allowed to live within a thousand yeah. yards of a well, school, the school is the one we all playground. like that's the one we all joke about and like understand but like the whole thing of an internet thing is just like what can you job do you get you're you're sentencing someone to like a job at mcdonald's that's yeah. really what you sentence them to mm-hmm. that's the thing that needs some serious reform as well as the is like the sex um the sex offender registry that needs to be fucking fixed because like some of this shit is just getting ridiculous you're getting high school kids put on it for sexting each other yes. and it's just like yes it's child pornography but like let's have some fucking nuance and like not ruin someone's life at 16 uh, there there was just an article out the other day that um there was an 11 year old that was put on the sex offender registry like what the fuck because, yeah <laughs> um because he had um you know his parents were giving him a bath he touched his sister's genitals and um it Child services came in and who fa- would, how'd they find how- I, I don't know okay, what, yeah. what all the details sure, sure, sure. of the story were, but I know that he was put on the sex offender registry at 11 years old. Wow, yeah, and there's no forgiveness, there's no forgiveness. If you on get that. taken in for prostitution or like solicita- solicitation, is that like the technical? Um, prostitution is usually a misdemeanor. Okay, so you don't um, get on the but a you're third not on conviction the- for prostitution is considered a felony. And does that get you on like a sex offender registry? Um, they can, um, they can also demand that you get tested for, um, SDI tested. Judges can have you be, um, chemically sterilized. Still? Yes. Still. Yeah. There's some shit that just needs to be fixed. Yeah. Oh, like, like I'm all like, yeah, like decrim, decrim, and then like, oh, but this thing, like all fucking that is like medieval. Yeah. Wow. So, so you were locked up at first. Uh, well, you you were put in jail at twenty five. Well, no, I, and- I I I actually did not get ditched. treated that badly okay. in the beginning. Um, I had an attorney. I knew that the indictment was coming. My attorney walked me through the initial arrest. Um, and then I moved to Florida and we fought it from Florida. And okay. so we were in litigation for three years and finally it dusted off the shelf and they said, you know, you're okay. going to have to come back. So I went back, I pled guilty and then I, I went back to Florida and never reported to Texas. Gotcha. And basically, you know, that was not appreciated at all. So do you just avoid <laughs> so, Texas? these days <laughs> but um i left texas yeah. i never reported um they picked me up in florida several times and texas never had me extradited sure. so they would hold they me in jail up, for in, in florida they picked you up for like that they for the would, text yeah, thing or they for had new the, charges they would oh, no okay. they would pick me up they would pick me up for um for the texas thing because sure. it was a violation of probation okay they'd hold me in jail over the weekend and then texas would say yeah we're not gonna come get her how many you times know, have you been charged with sex work related crimes four four yeah. Um, and were they all usually like, like ever, like they were all for running an escort yeah. service or, um, you know, they were all pimping related charges. Sure. Right. Yeah, prostitution related charges. Did they not did, like, did they just not care when you were solicit? Like, was that just thing they kind of like didn't give a shit about? I or? never got caught okay. as a, um, working as an escort because, um, I know that I went to calls that were cops at one time, but I just never, you know, I screened everyone when, I, b- before I went on a call, I screened them. Uh-huh. You know, um, but a lot of people didn't. So what was like, what was sex work like in, let's say the nineties, pre all this technology, pre the, the ads with the photos and, and pre like having websites where you can like, like blacklist 
you know, sharing and, and, and all that. Did you have, was there like blacklist sharing? Was there like community at all in, in areas? Oh, we had a wonderful community. Yeah. Um, when we had the, when we had the community, when I was running the escort service in Texas, we would meet at a restaurant that was a 24 hour restaurant and we would just come and go. Um, you know, the beepers would go off. Um, we had beepers. some, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. one of the biggest differences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the beepers would go off. We'd go to the pay phone. You'd make the phone call. Um, with with my service, we had a professional telephone and in, in system installed. We had twelve different numbers coming into this. We had twenty four hour um, people who were running the um, the phone twenty four hours. They were making commission based on you know the number of calls that they sent out. Um, it was a um, it was a good operation because if someone didn't want to do sex work for a while or they needed a break, they could get on the phone and they could earn good money mm. just being on the phone. So, you know, I mean, there were there were always opportunities and, you know, there's a huge turnover sure. in the industry. People decide they don't want to do it anymore and so they, they stop calling in or whatever. But Did you all have a blacklist sharing back then um, in a different we fashion? Didn't, we didn't have blacklist sharing, um, but we all kind of knew. I mean, there wasn't like official blacklist sharing. Um, but you the, all knew The level Tim, of violence yeah. Um, it didn't exist mm. then um, really? for escorts. Really? Um, no, I mean, that, there was still a lot that went on, you know, for street-based work. Okay. Um, and in San Antonio in particular, um, you know, over on the other side of town where there was a lot of um, gang activity and, and that kind of thing, you know, it was a, it was a whole different story. Mm-hmm. You, know? you, you never did street work? Never, I never did street work. Okay. okay. Never did street work. It was always um, escort or strip clubs. Sure. Early two thousands. I'm I'm curious, like the evolution of the sex work, like the, how it looks differently, um, it, as the technology kind of changes and grows. Because so, like even like probably two thousand two is a lot different than how people were getting clients a couple years ago. Well, it used to be you could call up and you'd get a phone number and you could put an ad in the yellow pages and every month you paid a piece of your. Yellow Pages bill with your phone bill. Yeah. And then it changed to where they wanted you to pay for your Yellow Pages ad all up front mm. because people would just disconnect their numbers or whatever. And then it got to be, and I can remember the time when I called to renew my ad and they would not take my ad for the Yellow Pages. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? <laughs> was it because they were, you know? like, were not taking sex because work? Because they were not taking sex work ads anymore. They were not taking um, ads for escort services anymore. So what did you and do? And so um, they were starting to go to um, magazines, weekly magazines, you know, like um, Orlando Weekly or Tampa Weekly or Tampa Bay Re- Weekly. They'd have these little magazine rags that you'd pick up. Um, there was another magazine that was called Vivid that came out mm. and they would be advertising, um, you know, body rubs and um, body body shop, um, body body rub massage places started popping now up. Now you're just putting me in the mood where I'm like, maybe I need to get like my You need a massage. massage. Yeah. I'll figure that out later. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, continue. Yeah, and and those became, you know, that became the new the new normal. And so you'd have to buy this really incredibly expensive ad in this magazine. Um, you'd have to buy several ads because, and it just got really really complicated. And there was so much. Everybody was so confused over the loss of the yellow pages that it became it just became a really complicated industry to be in. Mm-hmm. So what was the way to ad- adapt like from from that um you know that that was right before the internet started taking taking off okay. um and i think that that's probably and that's when i left mm-hmm. um the industry that's when i when i kind of transitioned out and remember i i had you at that know, point i, I got your point you're gotten, in your like early mid 30s right is that something? Uh, 38 okay yeah so um I was I was hitting the age where it's not as easy to do it anymore um as it was you know 10 or 15 years earlier. So you just um, were like well over a decade. Well over a decade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Close to close to 15 years. Amazing. Um 16 years, something like that. Yeah. I did it I did it for a long time. And um as a, it was a bumpy ride out, you know, um, it was a really bumpy ride out. Um, I had finally gotten arrested um, for a violation of probation and they literally brought me back. So they left me in um, a Florida jail for um, like 30 days, then came and picked me up and took me back to Texas where I stayed in um, a, a really rough jail um, for another 60 days. 
and um, then they put me back out on the um, on the probation. And at that time, I had re- recognized that I was going to have to complete this bitch um, one way or another. And so I just made the determination that I wasn't going to I wasn't going to keep fooling around. I was going to pass the drug test. I was going to quit doing the dope. I was going to, you know, I was going to straighten up. And I got a really good job and um, and and started my life over again. So you were using some drugs and, and uh, yeah, doing doing a lot of coke. Um, never really buying it, but still using it quite a bit. That was the, you know, the drug of choice. Um, smoking a little weed here and there. And so when you were like, oh, I'm going to clean up myself, uh, clean my act up with like the drug stuff, did that all overlap? Would that correspond with the like, oh, I'm also going to stop doing sex work as if it's like, I'm going to stop doing all these things. No, I kept doing, I kept doing, I kept doing drugs well into probably 2003, 2004. Um, and then I, I just, outgrew it okay and what and so what that, that decision to like stop doing sex work like i mean did did you did would you have these times when you like missed it i missed the money okay um i missed the money and and i and i will still say that you know every once in a while i have the opportunity <laughs> to you know to make a good chunk of change um that it's nice I just don't want to glamour. I, I just don't want to glamorize the idea that people think that they can just jump in, make a ton of money, and and then just jump out. Because even though it seems like that's what I did, it was stumbly and bumbly along the way. I mean, you know, so you um, want you want people like frivolously and you spend going it just into as fast. It. Yeah, you you spend it just as fast mm. as you as you earn it. Um, I'm I am basically a real. I'm really good at saving money, but I have seen lots of people who are not good at saving money. And, um, and that's not, that's something that you learn how to do. And, um, sex work is something that you make a lot of money in your younger years. And a lot of people have a hard time. I mean, not as many people are making just as much money when they get older as they are when they're young. And so, you know, there's a shelf life. Hmm. And so I just feel like it's really important to be real and to recognize that, you know, I mean, no, I'm not making as much money doing sex work, and I wouldn't be, even if I were doing it full time, as I did when I was 25, mm. you know, and that would be okay. Sure. You know, that would be okay. But I'm, I just recognize that now. And, yeah, and you know, good. sugar daddy wasn't a thing. Sure, sure. You know, I mean, it wasn't. I mean, we had regular clients um that wanted to, that wanted to see the same person over a period of time but, but there was nobody you. offering to take care of your bills for the month sure. that wasn't you know that was something that was developed of, out of the internet and and out of magazines and you know there's always been you know there there's one in a thousand clients that wants to connect with with the girl and usually they are the stalker and they you end up having to fire that client yeah you know do, do you think that the development of sugar babies like in the age of the internet came from a place of stigma to be like well it's not it, i'm not fucking for money i'm just like dating for some help do you, do you think that the sugar baby stuff played into that hierarchy that's I think out there that- the, it's in our DNA, uh-huh. you know, it, it's in, it's in the DNA of women to want to be taken care of. And it's in the DNA of men to want to take care of. Mm. Um, I think that, that, that's just something that's within that, that, that's just something that happens. And I think that there's, it's a levelized convenience of sorts, you know, really, really wealthy guys can afford to take care of, you know, someone, or several, mm-hmm. or a family plus one, you know, I mean, something like that. And, and college girls or, or younger women or, you know, someone who's setting out to do that, you know, you can, you can have that, you can have that relationship, mm-hmm. you know, you can do that, you know, but I think it, I think it's, uh, it's part of, it's, it's part of our existence. You want intimacy, you want to be with the same person, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, I think it's in our DNA. Okay. Okay. So now your work with Swap, uh, really great, awesome, like important work, and also now with the age in the age of like Sesta Fosta, Fosta Sesta. Can never remember which goes first. Yeah, uh, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, it's like they both the suck. chicken and the egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <it's, laughs> um, that's going on, and that is that must have made things very much more active in the last year or so. Um, <laughs> What so? What's like the state of sex work? I had Caitlin Bailey on, who uh, you're familiar with, uh, maybe like a couple months ago. So she kind of gave us a a nice uh, a little framing. Uh, we were talking about how that affects uh, various performers who aren't even sex workers, but who still fall in this like sex talking adult content world. 
you know, what's what's going on now? We've seen Tumblr has lost that. We've seen <laughs> innocent horrors people like myself lose <laughs> Instagrams. We've seen um, changes to Facebook and Instagram guidelines. We've we're starting to see like effects of this outside of actual sex work. Um, and and what's where are we at now? Is there any hope in this getting repealed, overturned, modified, anything like that? Our culture has become one that I mean, it, you know, there's always been the desire to control women's bodies you know they don't want us to have abortions they don't want us to, you know they, they wanted us to marry when we were really young to really old guys i mean it's something that's they gone want you on, changing eye contact you know, colors uh, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's so funny. Hey, you know it's a matter of convenience um <laughs> you know men have wanted to control what women do with their bodies for a long time and our culture has has kind of propagated this idea that women can't take care of themselves and um, evangelicals have become more popular. They're becoming more of our political framework. They're making um, they're, they're, they're starting to make decisions about our bodily autonomy that are not cool. Mm. And, um, and, and I think that at the end of the day, that's what, really frustrates me the more than anything in the world is that there's some guy in Washington that thinks he has the right to tell me what I can do with my body in Florida. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, and, and that really irks me. I mean, that, that irks me too. Yeah. But it's like, is there, what's a realistic route right now? Because we have a federal law, mm -hmm. but you're saying like, maybe we could try to do things locally. Well, we have different areas of the country who have different, feelings about the 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 whole idea of decriminalization legalization you know um nordic model i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of different models that that people are looking at um most of our northeastern um areas are a little bit more open to the idea of decriminalization um there's a movement right now in washington dc to decriminalize sex work and they recognize all of the benefits that decriminalization has on society and on the individuals who are trading sex including people who are underage mm -hmm. you know and they recognize that it gives them the opportunity to reach out for assistance to report crime against them um the co-founder of swap behind bars um dr Jill McCracken, just returned from new zealand and uh, and she was studying she's a researcher mm -hmm. and she was studying the effects of decrim after 10 years and because new zealand has had decriminalized sex work for 10 years and they literally don't experience any police violence anymore mm. um you know they they it's decriminalized there's no reason to harass them there's for it, no yeah. reason to harass them for it anymore um you know there still um is a hierarchy which is you know um, uh, upsetting to to recognize that they'll they're, that's still there. Which I'm sure we're going to hear plenty of, like here at AVN with the you know the porn stars who do sure, privates versus sure. the ones I who mean, don't do privates. I mean, this is a very sex work positive environment. You know, these are empowered sex workers that are here. But there is still like I still I still hear plenty of this shit with like porn stars who absolutely like they look down on the porn stars who do privates, uh -huh. or they look down you know or like uh, they look down on the crossover artists uh, who like do privates on the side secretly and shit like that. It's yeah, like, I, well, I mean. I mean, you know, in any in any industry, in any profession, there's going to be one group that looks down on the other group. I mean, you know, in if you're going to be a lawyer and you're going to be an ambulance chaser, you know, the guy that's going to be the First Amendment lawyer is going to look down on the guy who's who's being the um, the the ambulance chaser or doing, you know, there's there's that that um, hierarchy in any industry. Sure. And so I don't think that it's any different in the sex industry. I just think that we acknowledge it, mm -hmm. that it's there, you know? Um, and I think that that again is a part of our culture. We're, we're learning to understand that we're, we, we do stuff that's not right yeah. sometimes. <laughs> what's the, what's the next step you think? Cause like, yeah, what's we got we got an election coming up next year. Yes, we do. Um, we got, we got primaries, we got local races, um, can we see more? Do you think it's realistic? Are there talks with certain politicians that we can't talk about that, um, you know, who are people who are considering maybe putting decrim on their actual platform, like Siraj Patel? Like, is there hope? I'm because, like, that's that's one of the things. Like, granted, I I'm affected tangentially through this, uh, as many other like adult content creators are, um, and I don't see a hope. I genuinely get concerned, like. 
if this continues down a, down a bad path, like iTunes gets pressure to take down a show like mine. Uh, and then I don't know where my living goes. That's why I tell people, please sign up for my mailing list. You never know when I do like a platform because a platform comes and goes, but you know, y'all want me forever. But it's like what I guess I feel a little hopeless because I don't see a future where we get SESTA FOSTA repealed in a timely manner because it's not a pressing issue to politicians. Yeah. Swap held a lobby day or we sponsored a lobby day where we we sent a lot of sex workers to go talk to people in Washington about why they shouldn't um, sign off on SESTA-FOSTA. And they wouldn't went in and they talked to aides and to, um, you know, people who were working in the office and they explained it. And we, we got through to a lot of them. They heard us um, talking and we really thought that they were going to be able to talk their senators into not signing um but at the end of the day you know it came back in they signed it you know and it's all because that's what their they thought their constituents wanted they paced they passed this hasty legislation the law was not written well you know i mean they passed it in a really hasty manner i mean it's a knee-jerk reaction you know i mean fight online sex trafficking yes we don't want sex trafficking sex workers don't want people being forced into into sex work. I mean, we don't want that. Nobody wants mm -hmm. that. You know, that's it's that's crazy, but it's really the enabling pimps law mm -hmm. because as soon as SESTA and FOSTA passed and they pulled down Backpage, it was almost immediately that um, predatory people started reaching out to sex workers who they knew were in fear of, of being homeless and started saying, hey, listen, we, you and I, we can do business together, yeah. you know, and, and I mean, it happened almost immediately. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it was very harmful legislation. It's going to have to be repealed. Um, there's just not any other, there's just not any other option. We're going to have to go in there and we're going to have to keep working. Um, as people come to understand the harm that it's done and um, as people start, as, as real people like you, as real people that are in the community start to engage with sex workers, with sex worker rights activists, with just everyday normal people. And as they start to realize this is a really bad law and it's really harmful mm -hmm. and, and, they're going to vote new people in, you know, I mean, I, I, I really, I, I, I'm not hopeless. Um, I do think that this is a, a fight we can win, but I think it's going to take a long, hard push and it's going to take everybody working together. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're here at AVN. Um, we're trying to talk to the vendors, to people who don't know about SESTA FOSTA or people who know about SESTA FOSTA but thinks that it doesn't affect them. Right. There's literally no one here at AVN, including clients, that, that, that there isn't a possibility that they could be impacted by this law. So literally everyone needs to engage with this legislation and fighting this legislation. So someone listening right now at home, what can they do? Find out what your local politicians attitudes is towards sex work find out how they voted in the past regarding you know find out what your laws are in your community about prostitution um, find out what the services are in your community for people who have been exploited find out what the services are for people who want to exit sex work find out what the find out you know find out Make an effort to get to know what your community is because at the end of the day, all of these problems are community-based problems and they're not going to be solved in our legislature, but they are going to be solved by people who vote. Mm. And so everybody needs to vote. Mm. You know, they need to vote people in who will support legislation that makes sense, um, legislation that makes sense about sex work. Um, legislation that makes sense about gun control, um, legislation legislation that that makes sense about homeless stuff. I mean, there's there's just you know we need to to vote people in who are going to recognize that the value of our society is is measured by how we treat the most vulnerable members of our community, mm -hmm. and um, we got to do a better job. So some phone calls, some educating yourselves. I mean, I think that's a lot to ask of an American to actually read something or, you know, look yeah, into an issue. Yeah, but we can issue. do it. But we gosh, can do I, it. I, I hope so. We can um, do it. And you're you're doing fantastic work, and I thank you, you know, for doing it. And uh, where can people uh, find you? Where can they find Swap? Where they can, uh, if they want, if they're interested in becoming a pen pal with a sex mm -hmm. worker who's incarcerated, where can they go? Um, 
uh, Swap Behind Bars is www.swapbehindbars.org. Um, you can write to me at alex, A-L-E-X, at swapusa.org. Ask me anything. Um, we're looking for people to support us, um, financially. Um, but the most important thing that you can do is, um, support the members of your community. Um, if you want to send a book, you can go to our website. You can order a book for, um, a sex worker who's incarcerated. If you want to write a letter and, and bring a sense of community to someone who is, um, sitting in prison and, and is isolated from the rest of the world, we can we can help you do that. You can donate money. You can donate time. Um, but most importantly, get to know get to know a sex, somebody you love is a sex worker. Mm. Somebody you love is trading sex. And find out how you can ha- be their ally. Because it's not just sex work. Is not remember. It's not just. Uh, it's not just fucking someone for money. Uh-huh. It's not just stripping. It's the person who went and like did a, f- a few foot parties, a foot fetish parties mm-hmm. in college. It's that person who cams on the side. Mm-hmm. It's uh, someone who's a full on porn performer. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're, they're someone who's doing, you know, and phone we sex. all There's need to stand together and we all need to recognize yeah. that we are all in this together. Yeah. Um, you know, if this SESTA FOSTA legislation continues the way it is and the stigma and the isolation continues to grow and other countries start to take that, we're going to lose our ability to have any kind of adult related content on the internet. And think of what that's going to do to our lives as human beings. It's yeah, going that's to less man us. horror podcast in your life. <laughs> and isn't that the true tragedy? That is the of worst part all. of Sesta Pasta. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for chatting with it's me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for letting me crash on your couch. <laughs> Y'all are great. You're angels. And why don't you say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Thank you so much for listening. Isn't she a hoot? Like, I just, I, that's the, I don't know, that's the vibe I get. I'm just like, oh, she's a hoot. And if you want to hear more of me with Alex Andrews, or you just want to hear more Alex Andrews and are willing to tolerate me, We've got an awesome bonus episode uh, that comes out on Patreon tomorrow for all of my $5 and up members. Head on over to patreon.com slash podcast to get access today. Um, again, that's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash podcast. Yeah, we've got over 100 bonus episodes over there. Also, even if you don't want to give any money, go follow my Patreon page and you're going to get access to a free bonus episode every month. If all things go according to plan, I'm going to drop a bonus episode on Tuesday. That's like a big celebrity. Let's just say you like this episode. Let us know what you thought. Comment on my man whore podcast, Facebook page, tweet at me at the Billy Presida, or shoot me an email at man at at gmail.com. Again, April 16th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm doing a Reddit AMA, and I need your help to make it successful. At 2 p.m. Eastern Time, I need you to upvote. I need you to make a comment. I need you to ask a question. Early engagement puts that post in front of more eyeballs. And more eyeballs means more listeners for Billy, which is a good thing for all of us. Nervous you're going to miss it? Don't worry. Go to manwhorepod.com, sign up for my mailing list, and I'm going to send out an email as soon as it goes live. Next week, OMs and Gs. Nina Hartley, everybody. She's back. Is she, is she, you know, a porn star guest? Is she a past hookup guest? Technically, she counts as both. We did make out both on air and off air. And next week, you're going to get to hear how Billy gets to have a hand job next time he's in Los Angeles. You're not going to want to miss next week's, uh, you know, five year podiversary episode (laughs) with the wonderful Nina Hartley. But for now, you're just going to have to sit there and fantasize and stay slutty. (laughs) 